look at this, for example, right? Um, I, I know this one woman, and she is a proxy for millions of women and men across the country who leaves her home at 3 in the morning to travel to get to work at 7, leaving her children at home to go to school, arrive back home at 9 at night. When do you think will such a parent be able to give guidance and mentoring and support to their children? When? Ladies and gentlemen, um, we are today joined by Diane Treblant. Um She has a career that spans approximately 30 years um, in the legal profession. She started the professional career um, as a public interest lawyer, uh, in private practice and later shifted uh, focus to all aspects of consumer protection. So it's an honor, it's a privilege to sit down and have this important uh, conversation with you. As you would know, um, we celebrate 100 years of women uh, in law this year, uh, and we've come a long way. Uh, there's Since the first, uh, first time, there's much more women uh, in legal professions, in in, in various roles. Um, and I want us uh, today to f reflect on your journey sp in particular. So it's always good to start at the beginning. So where did you grow up and how did that shape you? I uh, grew up in Harlem, uh, not the one in the Netherlands, the one in the Langkloof. Uh, mission Station, Lutheran Mission Station to be precise. And uh, during the time that I grew up, we really moved around to many places. And the one thing the places have in common that we moved to is that they were all very isolated. Uh, we were in Grabau for a stint, we were in Wellington for a stint, and after I graduated I was in Cape Town. But why I mentioned that these places had one thing in common is they were all isolated. We didn't have running water. We didn't have electricity. Uh, and in Harlem, uh, what many people don't know is it gets really cold in winter. So, you know, what? and we didn't have much money growing up. My father was a, a, a farmer at a point, not successful because he became bankrupt as a farmer, so we knew really, really tough times. And what that tough times really taught me is when you put your mind to something, you can do it. It really taught me to have grit and perseverance and to do something that I put my mind to. But a huge influence in my growing up, as with many people, my mother. My mother believed in us implicitly, explicitly. And my mother always insisted that we are independent in, in our thoughts and in our lives. And she always believed that we can do it. Another great uh, characteristic of my mother, which also drove me, is that she never believed we could do anything wrong. Well, that's, of course, up for debate. But uh, that really, uh, my life and not having all these comforts that I have today really make me make a plan. And it really uh, drove me to being innovative around things. And I can say today, if it wasn't for my background, I probably wouldn't have felt so driven that if something is not working out that I can make a plan and I can find a solution. So. That's basically where I'm from. So, from humble beginnings, um, like Jack Schervel also at, at UWC, from humble beginnings always to greatness. So, uh, amazing story, amazing story that is that 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 is going to unfold uh, during this particular podcast. So, as you as you started with your humble beginnings, uh, is that you've moved. Uh, to different places. So where did you complete your schooling and how did you then later ended up studying law at UWC? I completed my schooling in Somerset West at Gordon Senior Secondary School. Uh, and it was a commute from Grabau every day. Not Grabau, the town, outside Grabau, the forest uh, station, uh, Lebanon. 
where we lived up in the mountains, four kilometers away from other people. And how I ended up at UWC, it's actually quite fortuitous. I, I always thought that I'm a victim of the quota system. And I actually think I'm a winner because the quota system excluded me from going to the so-called white universities. Because I applied, didn't get in, I got in at UWC. And what a good turn of fortune that was for me. Because my time at UWC was just really amazing. But um, I, I want to share just a little anecdote about UWC. I spoke to somebody the other day who was also at UWC because uh, I was told he's somebody who couldn't help me with something. And I said to him, oh, you know, you might not remember me, but my name is Diane Blanche. And he said to me, oh, no, I know you. You're the one who was always with your nose in the books. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up at UWC. I decided I want to study law. I decided my education is going to be a way that I can assist my parents in the future because uh, there was just no way that they were going to be able to really maintain and support themselves going into the future. Of course, my other siblings would help, but for me that was very important. I went to UWC to study, and what I did at UWC is I studied and read. I love reading, which is something else from my background. Because we were always in such isolated areas, I read and read and read by candlelight because we didn't have electricity, candlelight and oil lamps. And I still love it today, reading not the candles nor the oil lamps. Um, so you decided to study law. So mm. where, did, where did this idea of law come from? That this is the career I wanted. I don't know. I know I didn't want to be a teacher. I knew I didn't want to be a dentist. Um, I knew I didn't just want a, a, a degree that was not going to put me into a professional space where I had to do something additional because there was simply no money to do additional studies. So I wanted to do something that when I left university, I could go into something that is vocational. And I liked the idea of law because it gave me that feeling of, yeah, you can actually make a difference to your life and to the lives of other people. So that is why law. And, and I think over the years, um, starting your career, you have changed many, many people's life. So before you um, started a career in, in consumer protection, um, you were actually a public interest lawyer. Um, please tell us a little bit more about that and how you changed lives there. Yes. Um, when I started looking for articles, it was not easy. I had to really beat the pavements in Cape Town to get articles. Many doors were shut in my face. Um, being a black woman, I think it was really challenging. So I ended up with a law firm, a black law firm in Woodstock. And that law firm specifically at the time, remember it was the mid 80s, was really involved in political trials, uh, the whipping cases, the unlawful detention cases, uh, uh, town, townships were being burnt down, police brutality. So I got really involved in that across uh, Cape Town to Mossel Bay, George, Otsu and those places, all the places where we did these cases. So that is really where I got my first exposure to it and also to understand that, yes, look at this, one can actually make a difference to people's life when an unfairness had been perpetrated, you can actually help to put it right. Plus, of course, the damages cases that arose out of that. I did, uh, of course, like any other candidate attorney, had to do conveyancing estates, um, matrimonial law, my fair share of divorces, and so on and so forth. But uh, the, 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 the public interest work really resonated for me. And it made me feel like, you know, I had the fortune of being lifted out of where I came. 
Maybe through this one can also help others. That's where I am. So I moved to public interest law. Uh, wholesale, I was not going to really spend my life doing divorces. There's place for that, of course. There's place for good uh, divorce lawyers, but that was not the future I saw for myself. So, and, and that early work would later um, follow you and, 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 yes. and, and take, take on a different form. Yes. But be, before that, um, you were also at, at UWC, you were the, the, the director of the Legal Aid Clinic um, yeah. during the late 1980s. Yeah. Tell us more about the time and, and how did um, that prepare you kind of yeah. for a post-apartheid South Africa that is, that yeah. is emerging yeah. from negotiation. Can, can I take you back a little, yes. if you don't mind? Um, because uh, at the firm was, of course, the start of my public law interest, uh, public interest uh, career. Uh, but where it really got cemented was at Legal Resources Center in Johannesburg. Uh, because at Legal Resources Center, of course, um, there was a lot of test litigation. And the test litigation aimed at uh, seeing how laws and policies can be changed through uh, using the courts and the court system. Did a lot of work, again, with police brutality. A lot of work uh, around children and children's rights. That was very, very painful. A lot of child abuse cases. A lot of cases auditing uh, the prosecutions of people accused of child abuse. Um, even uh, medical malpractice around children, did a lot of work around that. And also really had to look at how the laws are really geared towards assisting uh, the prosecutions for child abuse matters. That was really, really difficult. And that uh, time saw uh, the start of the separate rooms where children could give evidence, the way in which evidence is collected for children who had been subjected to child abuse, got involved in NGOs around that. Um, uh, social justice matters, um, and also environmental justice matters, which is very interesting as well. Um, yeah, and then, of course, my first exposure to another huge area of public interest, which is consumer protection work, which is what I uh, went into in my uh, later years. Uh, and so then it was UWC, um, the, the, the being the director of the, yes. the, the, the legal um, aid clinic. Uh, yeah. So tell us more about that also in... And, and the interesting work and the extension um, of the Legal Aid uh, Clinic yes. during that time. Yes. Um, I, I loved working at the UWC Legal Aid Clinic. There were two things that happened in that time that was for me very important. I wasn't there for very long. It was in between the time that I finished my master's degree in the U.S. and coming to Johannesburg to the Legal Resources Center. And the Legal Resources Center, when I got to UWC, was very much campus-based. And uh, with the powers to be, there was an agreement that it can expand into the communities around the university as well as into the Borland. So the students could go out and they could then also work with farm workers, the issues with farm workers and so on. And that was very exciting. And the other thing uh, uh, that happened is that uh, the practical legal studies component to the students who were studying law at the time, who could then do their practical legal studies at the, you know, at the uh, legal aid clinic, not like being recognized for articles or anything like that, but having a module that is more practical than uh, uh, um, a non-practical. And uh, that was presented as a course module then at the university, which my colleagues presented, and I basically oversaw the students in the clinic. And I think uh, that made a shift, an important shift, in how law is taught at the university. Um, but still being at UWC since my, my undergrad, the one thing that I can say is that, uh, that there's a service that comes from the law faculty, it's, it's, it's strong, 
community based. Um, yes. It's it's plugged in. Yes. Even now, it previously was a community law center. Now it's the Tula Oma um, Institute. Uh, they still plug uh, still plug in, yeah. and it's yeah. it's the amazing work uh, that a group of people did during the nineteen mm. eighties and and mm. and set uh, kind mm. of the blueprint for South yeah. Africa that is emerging. Yeah. yeah. So so after this, you started emerging. Uh, you started entering um, con- con- consumer. Uh, uh, protection. So, mm. so how did you enter that profession? I uh, at Legal Resources Center in Johannesburg. Um, I uh, got involved with the consumer protection side of it, uh, and that part of the law within Legal Resources Center. And I got exposed to an organization called Consumers International. And I started attending the conferences, got really, really interested in the work they're doing. And uh, also used to attend on behalf of South Africa whenever they had conferences and so on. So in 1996, I then uh, resigned from Legal Resources Center because I got funding to start a consumer organization, Consumer Institute South Africa. And... uh, I had a very important thing that I had to achieve. What was happening at the time was that many policyholders were not getting payouts on their policy proceeds. The reason they were not getting it out is that there was a provision in the law that exempted insurance companies from what is termed the induplum rule. Very technical, but nevertheless, the long and the short of it is that they could raise policy loans against the policies, and the policy loans could potentially become so big that the people at the end, when they want to claim against the policies, there's no proceeds left against in the policies. So my first and initial objective was to get that provision removed from the law. And I got quite a bit of support around that. So in 1998 and 99 legislation, the Induplum rule was removed from the law. And also with the uh, the, uh, National Department, National Treasury and so on, uh, there were also then regulations introduced around how the policyholders can be protected in the process of entering into policies. That was very important work for us. Um, But besides that, I also got really involved in looking at, well, our consumers being protected and how is there cohesion in the system and the structures around consumer protection? And uh, then I was approached to do a position paper on how would a consumer protection structure potentially look like for South Africa. And I developed that in 1999 and submitted that uh, also to the department that was responsible for it at the time. Uh, Of course, the extent to which they used it or not was not really up to me. But the Consumer Protection Act did then come forward. Uh, which was passed in 2008. So that is how basically I moved into it. But I also got involved in lobbying across the world on so many different things around consumer protection. Food labeling. What's on your food labels? Uh, Clothing sizing. Uh, Should you really call a large in China, a large in South Africa? With globalization, uh, international marketplace, how do you standardize these things? How do you have a standard that's applicable in South Africa and make sure that that standard is applicable across the board so that when people buy from anywhere in the world, they know that they are protected to the same standard? You know, a whole lot of things around that, but it fascinated me and I absolutely loved it. So that was my start in consumer protection. And I'm also fascinated because um, these things that consumers just take for granted it's it's many years of of, of hard work behind the scenes, yes. tirelessly yes. Uh, preparing, lobbying, uh, fighting, uh, getting rejected, and then uh, go back to the drawing board and and mm. and, and and keep fighting fighting mm. again. Mm. But apart from the amazing work that you just do in com- uh, uh, um, consumer protection, um, 
for this work you also got recognized and you held very high level and i mean very high level leadership positions mm -hmm. for example you were the ceo of Con the of consumer institute south africa you mm -hmm. were the deputy chairperson of the council for medical scheme the chairperson for chico def um and the executive chairperson of the national consumer tribunal mm -hmm. now I, I name all of this for people listening to this podcast is because it's important for women to be in executive leadership positions. Mm. And I would like to know from you is um, explain to us that the role that women play in these positions and, and how that uh, changes society over time. Mm. Uh, these roles, you know, um, previously there were not that many women in big executive roles. And for me, it was really a learning experience. Um, I was, of course, uh, the executive of uh, Consumer Institute, very much driven by the agenda that we have set for ourselves. Um, but for me, where really I felt I could bring myself as a woman to the role was really when I was uh, 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 entrusted with the responsibility of uh, establishing the National Consumer Tribunal. And why that was such a great opportunity is because I could start with a blank slate in terms of establishing the organization, putting up the structure, getting the staffing and all of that. But I was also driven as a woman, particularly, in ensuring that people, when they come to the organization, they feel like they are actually welcome. That when they come to the organization, they don't feel that they're imposing on the people who are working there. Because often we go to organizations and feel, oh, why am I interfering with this person's day? You know, so it was very important to really establish that in the organization for people who approaches uh, the consumer tribunal to feel that they actually matter and that they will be assisted, but there would be a system in a welcome and warm way. And that for me, I think I could bring to the table as a woman. And also about uh, the people in the organization just being interested in them. Um, I'm not sure if it's uh, always just a woman thing or a personality thing, uh, but I think as a woman I felt I, I brought that to the table for these organizations. Yeah, it's, it's been a long journey and I think also looking back you also think of so many things that can be done differently, right? But I suppose it's all in the learning. But that's where I was at. And and the strange thing is we never stop never stop to learn. Every day no. is, is a new opportunity no. to, uh, to learn. But you also um, had uh, Diane um, Tablan's attorneys. Please tell us some more uh, about that journey yeah. and how did that came about. Yes. Um, okay, so I, uh, I, when we achieved our mandates with the Consumer Institute South Africa CISA, I then started branching out to other types of work. I was then a member of the Competition Tribunal, one of the first members in 1997. And um, then I got quite an interest in competition regulation, also consumer protection, because you talk about expanding choice for consumers by uh, the, uh, concentrating the markets, uh, choices, and so on and so forth. Uh, then from the competition uh, tribunal, I then joined uh, the Competition Commission South Africa as head of enforcement and exemptions. I spent there about three years. Uh, that time of the milk uh, inquiry, the car inquiry, the steel inquiry and so on. But you see competition and the issue of choice is but a part of the overall consumer protection environment, in my view. And I was really passionately interested in the broader consumer protection issues. So I left and then I started up my law firm, not to practice as, practice as a 
lawyer in the traditional sense, but to really consult around consumer protection issues. And I did that both in South Africa and in other parts of Africa. For example, for the one country, I did a, a policy paper on uh, strategies for how consumer protection can enhance uh, economic development uh, in countries. In another country, I did work around um, how do you take a law and implement it effectively so you disaggregate the parts and you say, now how do you take each one of these parts and make sure that it gets implemented effectively across the organization in terms of how the organization is set up and what the responsibilities are for each and every one of the divisions and how the accountability for that works from the bottom up to the top and how then the governance and oversight happens and the accountability uh, to the government. Then other work I also did um, was I was also then approached by the then DTI, now DTIC, Department of Trade, Industry and, and Competition, then just DTI. And uh, I then was appointed as a policy advisor for the development of the Consumer Protection Act. And I also was involved in the roadshows, going around, understanding what people want from the Act, how they want to see it implemented and so on, and feed it back into the legislative process, legislative drafting process, and the process of getting it adopted through Parliament. Um, other work I did at the same time, I also do quite a bit of legislative drafting, again, just consumer protection. So I've drafted legislation uh, for another country on consumer protection and competition regulation. And I've also drafted a piece of legislation for uh, 16 other African states. Uh, I'm not sure where in the process they know now are with that specifically, but I was involved in doing the, in the initial drafting with a few other uh, um, experts from other parts of Africa. And then, of course, I started with consumer protection uh, tribunal and because of that was really a full-time involvement and I couldn't really do as much of this other work because it really just took up all my time for the next 10 years or so. So after such a, um, such a brilliant career, an amazing career, it's, it's time for, for us to, to re reflect a bit um, and also looking forward. Mm. Uh, like UWC's uh, motto is saying. Uh, so we are celebrating 100 years of women in South Africa. Um, so what are your reflection on the state of women in the legal profession? And will it be better in the next 100 years? Mm. I, think, I think women have made great strides in the legal profession. I think it is still difficult. Um, and I think it would always be difficult because many women will be put to choice around uh, having family, children, and having a career and focusing on a career. And I think that is a very, very difficult choice to have to make. And I think the choice you make will impact how far you get in the profession because it can be a very, very challenging profession where really the pound of flesh is, is asked for and extracted. So I think uh, for women, I think unless there is really huge changes around um, how women can be, uh, and I'm not using the word accommodated lightly, but it is actually that. Because just think about a woman going off on maternity leave for four months or six months or whatever the case may be, stepping back into a practice. How easy or how difficult is that? You know? So I think they are all of those things to consider. I don't think they're easy uh, questions to answer. I don't think they're easy challenges to overcome. But what I do see that in spite of all of that, 
a lot of women have made amazing progress and yet been able to maintain a healthy family life. So one can probably also learn and ask, how have they done it? You know, I think that's an important question to start engaging with. I think that's that's a much better question is how did they how did they do it? How did they manage? Mm. Because mm. Uh, the 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 playing field was definitely not mm. not equal. Mm. Mm. But next year we our democracy uh, is turning thirty. Um, mm. So, what's your your reflection as a woman on our state of democracy mm. in South Africa? It's it's been challenged all over the place. Mm. Um, will will it be better for women specifically in the next 30 years? That is a difficult question to answer. Sometimes I wish I had a crystal ball that can tell me that because it will definitely help all of us, right? But we can only look at what we have and we can then draw inferences from what is in front of us and say, oh, okay, from what is going on, Maybe going forward, it will be better. Yeah, all I can say is as women, if we can decide how we pull together forward, I think it can be better. You know, if you just look at how many women against all odds actually are making it. And I think increasingly that will be happening. So I think as far as I can see, women has made great advances and I believe will continue making advances also be to be the voices in the democracy for the democracy. Women played an amazing role um, in our democracy. It was a women's march in this month. Mm. We, we, we're celebrating that. Um, but then there is many forgotten women Mm. Their husbands is elevated, but the, the important mm. role that women play uh, mm. are somehow sometimes for, mm. forgotten. And, mm. and I don't want this podcast to ever forget um, mm. any, any person. So that's, mm. that's why the mm. focus is so strong on, on, on mm. women because mm. women have an equally, uh, equal voice mm. and an equal place in society. Mm. And yet they are the poorest of the poor yeah. in, in South Africa. Yet yeah. they are the, the victims of, of gender-based violence yeah. uh, with children. So... Mm. How do we deal uh, with gender-based violence in South Africa when so many cases go underreported in the perpetrators? Mm. When it's get the, with the, the report that they get away with it. So how do we mm. deal with it? Mm. Um, you know, that again is a really difficult question to answer. Many people jump to the reform of the criminal justice system uh, penalizing the, uh, the, 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 the people who are perpetrating the violence. But there are so many fundamental issues, societal issues, that I think are very, very critical to consider. You know, so many young people go completely without guidance. And not because the parents don't want to give them the guidance, but the parents can simply not be there to give them the guidance. So there's really more and more a need of uh, a situation where there's much more support to young people, young men and young women. You know, just how to navigate life generally speaking, just issues around the fundamental values of respecting oneself and respecting others. I really think that is where the work also lies, beyond the fact that it really lies at the level of what is the social uh, structure and how that should look. And the economics plays a massive role insofar as this is concerned. But in as far as the violence itself is concerned, it is also about maybe a higher level of consciousness about the triggers to the violence and how people can recognize their triggers and how they can be helped around those triggers not going off in the first place. 
but it is a massive amount of work. The last part of it would be the criminal justice system. And not only the criminal justice system in terms of penalizing people, but also the criminal justice system in terms of rehabilitating people and making them full uh, participant in the social structure. So it is, it's not an easy, easy uh, question. I know of people who are doing a lot of amazing work in the NGO sector around fighting that, and more and more the emphasis is really shifting towards economic empowerment. I think this, this is a great answer. I think any policy, um, government official, or anyone mm. who will listen to this particular answer would have a much more nuanced understanding um, mm. of it. Let's deal with the social, let's deal with the economic. And the, the last thing that we have to start looking at when we look at the problem is the, is, is the criminal justice system. Mm. So, Yeah, because look at this, for example, right? Um, I, I know this one woman and she is a proxy for millions of women and men across the country who leaves her home at three in the morning to travel to get to work at seven, leaving her children at home to go to school, arrive back home at nine at night. When do you think will such a parent be able to give guidance and mentoring and support to their children? When? You know, and, and if you don't know something, if nobody's ever taught you that, if you've not been exposed to it, how will you know it? A young woman said to me one day, she came and she had a child and the child was busy spilling sugar all over the place and she was asking me, and she saw me looking at it and she asked me, should I be doing something about this? And I said to her, yes, I think you should say to your child not to do it. She said to me, you know, I actually never know what to do because I've, <laughs> I've grown up with a grandmother or not with my own mother, so I've not received that guidance. So I don't know how to guide my child. So that is unfortunately where many people find themselves. Unfortunately. It's unfortunate, uh, but I think there's hope. And I want us to leave uh, on a very hopeful note. note yes where you are looking at, at your career, looking back, dominated by men, but yet despite the domination and the patriarchy of men, um, you made it. There's mm -hmm. young women out there that also want to follow your footsteps. Um, what is the advice that you would give to young women who wants to enter mm. the legal uh, profession mm. and most probably in your footsteps? Mm. Of course, there are the usual culprits, education, competence, willingness to work, willingness to put in the effort and the hard work. Uh, but you know, there is something that makes it hard for people to enter. It is the opportunity, but even if the opportunity is not there and you can't recognize it, it also doesn't help you. So it is really about always be on the lookout and inform yourself about what are the possible opportunities. There are so many different routes you can go in these days with law. Some of them are still very much a mystery to myself, but there are so many streams. It's to really inform yourself, to be able to recognize that opportunity when it comes on, in, uh, on, on your way. But I think also, I've had the benefit of a mentor when I started Consumer Institute. I cannot tell you how much that advantaged me. So if you can identify a mentor and that person is willing to mentor, I think it is always something that will stand you in good stead. You know, because that mentor can also actually help you uh, navigate the more of the difficult, nuanced things that you have to deal with in your career that you cannot get from a book and that they have because of the experience that they have. 
I think that is very important. But the other thing is that I think you must also have a good hard look at yourself and really look at, you know, I am because I'm part of a whole and how do I impact that whole and how does that whole impact on me? I think that's very important. You know, you are never on your own. And, you know, you sometimes go forward and people ask for references. And I think it's very important to be mindful that you're part of a community and how you uh, work within that uh, uh, environment is something that can come back to haunt you. And all of us have a story to tell about that. I think it's to be mindful, to be careful, to ensure that you know you work with other people and be respectful of them and be insistent that they're respectful of you. And thank you very much um, uh, for joining us on this podcast and share your journey. Um, I appreciate it. And I think many listeners who's going to um, tune into this episode is also going to pre appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.